Last video on the uh, 2021 American Occupation Health Conference. So today I attended two very interesting sessions and the first one was the CO Seppington Lecture on the Epidemiology of COVID-19 provided by Dr. Osterholm. Dr. Hosterholm was a member of the a group of experts that helped the transition between the administration Trump to the administration Biden a couple of months ago. So um, it provided a bunch of information on the uh, current situation with the COVID-19 pandemic at a worldwide scale, uh, mentioning the fact that um, despite the fact that um, the pandemic is going not so bad currently in the US, as long as we do have hot spots somewhere else in the world uh, and outbreaks um, elsewhere, uh, we are not done yet in Northern America with the, the virus. Um, he said several times that he has uh, no answers to all questions, that there are a lot of things that he simply do not know currently. For instance, the um, dynamic of this curve of the COVID-19 pandemic, why it goes up and then why it goes down, why we do have a trend uh, that goes straight up at some point. It may be explained by the uh, mitigation strategies currently in place that may somehow change a little bit the curve, but probably not explain all of the dynamic. There may be other factors that play a role, but he, he, he acknowledged that it wasn't able to explain the whole thing. So then he, he provided a little bit of um, explanation on the variance, reminding us the uh, criteria uh, that help us classify a variant as a variant of concern. So it was mentioned in the lecture uh, from the director of the NIOSH yesterday. So you would see the previous video. Um, so as a reminder, um, a variant of concern is changing the immune protection. So currently we don't have that much certainty as to whether or not the current variants of concerns would actually change a lot the immune protection. We would need some more data to, to make sure that it may or may not change the um, protection. Second, the variant of concern is more transmissible. And third, they are more, uh, they provide some, um, uh, they provide more severe diseases. Um, He's been involved, Dr. Osterholm has been involved in uh, the investigation of a number of clusters and outbreaks with variants, including the B117 variant, the English one, uh, that is more infectious, provides more severe diseases. Uh, the attack rates has reached uh, mm, uh, almost 100% in some situations. And this um, makes this con variance of concern quite close to what we could see with the measles virus. So a major transmission, very high rates of attack uh, with those um, variants of concerns. Uh, how do we stop these variants from developing? Answer would be vaccination. We need to vaccinate not just the United States, not just Canada, not just the Northern America, but all the world needs to be vaccinated. And as long as there will be hot spots, uh, places in the world where there is increased transmission, it would remain a threat for the rest of the world. So this pandemic needs to be taken at a global scale. We are not yet close to have everyone vaccinated on Earth. Um, he mentioned the situation currently in the Seychelles. Um, so there, they had a very, very high level of vaccination, probably one of the highest in the world, but they have um, currently an outbreak and they are currently undergoing a lockdown. They've been vaccinated with the Sinovac vaccine, so the Chinese vaccine, but the thing is that the efficacy of this vaccine is probably way lower than the other approved um, by the FDA uh, vaccines, which are namely the Moderna, Pfizer and Janssen. I don't have any links of interest with any of those um, companies. So um, a lot has been done, but 
we are not there yet and there is no uh, like speech on we are we see the light at the end of the tunnel no we we are not just there yet we have to finish the job we need to have more people vaccinated uh, and this is not uh, done yet after this uh, presentation there were uh, some some q and a's afterwards so um, question on the uh, recent CDC guidelines uh, to lift some of the restrictions for those who have been vaccinated. So um, the opinion of Dr. Osterholm on that is that, well, people who have been vaccinated are going to be protected. And if they gather one which is which eat other being vaccinated, the risk of transmission of COVID within this context is pretty much very low. Uh, however, the um, efficacy rates we've seen at the beginning of vaccination, the vaccination studies showing a 95% efficacy, is probably not what we're going to get in real life because those numbers were obtained with a pharmac pharmaceutical trials, uh, with a selected population, with um, controlled uh, outcomes and, 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 and so forth. We are sure, for instance, that everyone has gotten all of the injections at precise dates. And in the, the real world, we are not sure that those who have the first dose of the Moderna or Pfizer are going to get the second one. So overall, it would decrease the efficacy of the vaccine. And if we reach uh, in real world 80-85% uh, of effectiveness, it would be considered as great. So if we are with those numbers, it also means that we have 15 to 20 percent of people with no uh, or lower uh, effectiveness with the vaccine. And it took a, a comparison that was quite um, helpful to understand his point of view on that. Uh, let's assume you are working as a firefighter. You have to go on, on the flames uh, you wear a, a, a fire suit, it's going to protect you, of course, 99% you are not going to get burns and, and whatnot. That's great. But this is not because you, you, you wear such a suit that you are going to throw yourself voluntarily on flames. So it's it needs to be the same with the, the vaccination. The vaccination is a little bit like this fire suit. It's going to protect you, it's going to provide excellent protection but it's not a reason that would allow you to take all of the risky behaviors and gathering and so forth that may increase the risk of uh, getting COVID. Uh, he answered a couple of questions. I, I'm um, like moving a little bit uh, forward. Um, he insisted on the fact that the uh, airborne transmission has been well documented. It's, uh, it's now the um, most important way of getting COVID. Uh, and the evidence of a formite transmission is um, lacking uh, to, to his opinion. Um, a question was the, the, uh, very interesting on whether or not there is a chance of uh, COVID-19 becoming an endemic disease. He said clearly it's going to happen, there is no question. So COVID is here to stay. It's not going to go anywhere for many reasons. The first reason is that uh, we do have a bunch of reservoirs. Uh, many animals are infected, including uh, tigers, dogs, cats, minks, and the virus is uh, spreading in these reservoirs of animals. So it can jump back to the human afterwards. Then uh, the question of the herd immunity. Uh, people and many people have misunderstood what was meant with herd immunity. Never, the, the idea was never to, to, to stop totally the transmission of COVID-19, but just to slow down the, the transmission, not to stop it. Uh, then the variants are going to change the, the transmission with some situation with 100% attack rate and characteristics closer to the measles. So this is um, a little bit concerning though. Um, and um, a problem with some groups of folks with lower uh, vaccination rates, 
uh, because it's more complicated to have to give them access to the vaccine or there are um, systemic barriers that are preventing them to, to get the vaccine, such as um, black and pers person of color, uh, people living in rural areas. Uh, some of those uh, individuals have lower rates of, of vaccination, and we've discussed that in the presentation of the director of NIOSH yesterday. It's on the other video that I, I uh, provided on my channel. Um, so basically, the virus is going to be here and to stay here, and we should move forward and work around this. Mitigation strategy, uh, why it has not been working that much. He mentioned the um, use of masks and is mentioning that we speak on wearing masks, but we rarely mention the question of the timing, how long we should wear a mask, how long a mask would be effective, and the concentration of virus in the air we are uh, breathing, uh, even though we're wearing a mask. Uh, taking into account that if you wear an N N95 or FFP2 mask, it's going to protect you quite well. This protection drops when it comes to uh, utilize, um, the utilization of a uh, face cloth mask or surgical mask. They are leakage, uh, so you breathe a little bit each time of the air where you are. So if you are in a room, eight hours with a mask with leakage, at some point the concentration of viral particles is going to build up and you're going to inhale some. So it's important to have this in mind. It's not just enough to say wear a mask and that's it. No, we need to take in in, into account how long and proper ventilation as well. It's mentioned a, a study they've been doing or reporting uh, on uh, people for the use of, of masks, so in favor of masks, among this group of individual of people in favor of masks, twenty six percent of them uh, were wearing their mask under their nose. So even the uh, people really convinced of uh, of the the importance of wearing mask, proper uses is not a hundred percent. It's mentioned a bunch of other uh, elements. I'm I'm like. Cutting short right now, it's, it was a very, very interesting presentation. Uh, he mentioned that he's been involved in podcasts, so you may be interested. I'm going to put his um, Twitter account. There may be some links to the podcast. I have not heard the, the, the podcasts uh, so far, but it may be a resource you may want to, to look at. And the second and final uh, session that I attended today was in um, was on occupational and environmental health in the developing world. Um, different speakers uh, reporting on the uh, under reporting of occupational diseases uh, everywhere, but also and in particular in developing countries. Also mentioning the fact that this wording developing and developed countries it is much more an economical thing rather than a, a term approved by the united nations um, it's basically based on the gross national income rather than on other uh, factors um, so all in all uh, 85 percent of the world population live in non-high high income countries and 85 percent of the world workforce do not have access to uh, occupational health and safety services um, there are problems with um, outsourcing of risky industrial processes from the high-income countries to low-income countries and those industry benefit from lower uh, safety standards and lower costs so it's we are transferring the risk from the rich countries to the poor countries it's a it's always a problem when it comes to having a look into the developing countries um, occupational health issues i guess i mentioned that in a communication at the previous ICO Congress in 2018. Uh, this is something that is like 
a, um, an ongoing concern when we see occupational health at the global um, level, this transfer of risks from the places with good occupational health services to places where there is no, nothing and companies can say, oh, we are doing well with occupational health and safety. Well, there is no control, there, there no one is actually monitoring what's happening uh, up there. So this is quite a problem. Um, the speaker, and actually uh, at that point it was Dr. Savoul, uh, mentioned the catastrophic um, uh, collapse of uh, the garment factory in Bangladesh, uh, in Dhaka, a couple of years ago that have killed, um, that has killed uh, 1,100 workers um, at that time. He mentioned the international standards, the ILO recommendations, as well as the conventions uh, and um, the various stakeholders involved in policy development in occupational health, including international organizations, ILO, uh, IARC, and also ICO, of course, and the IOMSC that has been created in 2013. So quite uh, a recent organization there, but uh, really dynamic uh, over the past year, uh, especially. He also mentioned uh, uh, an association called Workplace Health Without Border, and actually the two next speakers of this session were uh, from this organization. So it's a charity uh, that you, you, any occupational health specialist and professional can uh, be a member. It's been created in 2011, membership is free. I'm gonna put the link uh, in the um, description box uh, below the video. Um, so this association provides some training in occupational health, in occupational hygiene, training services, uh, linked with the uh, NIOSH in particular and uh, some universities. There are branches in the UK, in the USA, in Australia, and there are projects for uh, the development of uh, branches in Africa. Um, so there, there were a couple of initiatives in occupational health and safety, uh, silica measurement campaigns with agate uh, polishers, uh, mentoring programs, um, campaigns of measure, measuring in uh, nail salons, as well as uh, some project with um, waste workers. Um, and final, uh, this association is currently uh, setting up a mentoring program so to pair some occupational health providers together to help those who have a low um, density network, let's say like this, uh, to have some support and resources through this association. So they are going to make some pairs for 12 months and they are going to assess the effectiveness of the, their program. So this is the conclusion of this video. Overall, it was an excellent conference. Um, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of practical information, uh, some workshops on physical examination actually were uh, very useful for my practice as an occupational medicine specialist. Um, I really enjoyed the session on barium. That was a, a good refresher and an overall review on this, uh, mentioning all of the complexity of dealing with the barium lymphoproliferation test. And some of the keynotes, including those from the director of NIOSH and uh, the one I just mentioned uh, of uh, Dr. Osterholm, were absolutely great. So overall, it was an excellent conference. The next one is going to be next year in 2022 in May, uh, from May 1st to May 4th uh, in Salt Lake City, Utah, if I'm not wrong with my US geography. So, and I guess it will still be possible to attend remotely uh, as well. So that's it for this Congress. Uh, thank you for watching this video and I'm looking forward to seeing you uh, in the next, in, um, next occupational health uh, event.